Uh, welcome back. Um, what I want to talk to you about today is um, some of the details about what we understand happened very early on in the Big Bang. So um, I'm going to stay on this picture, I think, and tell most of the story I wanna, uh, that I want to tell today uh, off of this picture. And then I'll just kind of quickly go through the slides with text on them and see if I missed anything. But basically, you look out here on the right-hand side, and this would be like the modern universe with, uh, you know, as we see it and observe it and understand it today. And as you go backwards in time by going over here to the left, you know, you have a shrinking universe and more or less everything looks very, very familiar. But at some point in the distant past, some 13, over 13 billion years ago, you get to a point where the first clouds of hydrogen and helium have not been collected by uh, gravity uh, to be um, compacted enough uh, to form the first stars. And so there's an age of cosmic darkness way back here um, over 13 billion years ago. And then, of course, the first stars are born, and then the first galaxies are born, and then you have a, you know this, this evolution of a universe that looks familiar to us today. So what I want to do is go back uh, even before that point, so before the first hydrogen and helium is formed, because I think the story from there forward is one that we have covered in class and kind of makes sense to people. Um, let's talk, let's go through this uh, cosmic microwave background creation event here. So at this point in time, some 400,000 years after the Big Bang, um, this is the point at which the universe uh, ex has expanded enough and cooled down enough that the plasma state of all the charged particles uh, is actually uh, collapses and congeals into regular neutral matter. So before 400,000 years ago, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, before that period, it was basically the entire universe was like the interior of a star, and then it was so hot that um, all of the particles were free and loose. And so, yeah, you had protons and you had alpha particles, which are the nucleus of helium atoms, and you had electrons, uh, but they um, were flying free around. And just like, remember when we talked about the fusion process in the core of the sun, that the plasma is so hot and dense there that it takes, uh, you know, hundreds and thousands of years for a single photon to work its way out of the core. Um, and that's because all any type of light that's produced is instantly absorbed and re-emitted in a random direction by a charged particle it encounters, right? And so it is at this point, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, that space becomes mostly empty. And that's because the electrons have been captured by the re uh, their respective hydrogen and helium and trace amounts of lithium nuclei. And so the matter is mostly neutral and there's empty space and so the light actually is traveling through that space and it is those photons of light traveling through that space as the universe expands that we capture today in the form of the cosmic microwave background right and so that light is actually you know the light the ionization energy of, of hydrogen um, and uh, so that would have been basically a kind of a reddish color much more higher frequency than we see today and that's you know the cosmic uh, I shouldn't say Doppler shift, right? But it's the cosmic redshift of those photons traveling through an expanding universe that we're collecting today and telling us about the structure and shape of that time, okay? So the story from there forward now I think is understandable. Now if we go behind that, <clears throat> go behind the curtain, I need to talk a little bit about uh, particle physics. I mean, this is a very interesting thing that when you are studying... Uh, astronomy and you're worried about cosmology, that is the origins of the universe, and trying to understand the sequence of events that I'm describing to you here, you um, actually come full circle and have to talk to and think about the smallest physics in the universe, right? So to explain the largest scale structure of the entire universe, you have to understand particle physics. And what we have grown to understand over the course of the last uh, 100 years or so is that yes, things are made out of atoms, and yes, those atoms are made out of electrons and protons and neutrons, and yes, that under explains all of chemistry and <clears throat> a lot of nuclear physics, but that's not the end of the road, right? Um, physicists have been on a quest, which has pretty much uh, been fulfilled, of trying to find what we would term fundamental particles, right? So not just any old building blocks, like protons, neutrons, electrons, good enough to explain the periodic table, but are they fundamental particles? And the answer is uh, some of them are and some of them aren't. So what do I mean by a fundamental particle? It means 
can I break it down any farther, right? Are there, um, is there internal structure inside of an electron, inside of a proton, inside of a neutron? And if there is, then can I break it apart and look at the pieces within? And if I can do that, then it's not a fundamental particle. It's not the end of the road, right? And the answer is, interestingly, it is true in the case of the electron that there is no internal structure and there are, it's not made of any constituent parts. So you can't break an electron into smaller pieces. So an electron is on the list of fundamental particles, right? Protons and neutrons, not so. Uh, they're inside of there. They're a seething cauldron of quarks and gluons, and so they do have internal structure, and you can break them apart. And so when you're going back towards the origin event here, further to the left, uh, you know, helium and hydrogen, those atoms that then everything else in the universe is formed of, that's kind of the end of the line. So to have those, you need to have protons, neutrons, and electrons. And the electrons were created in the very beginning, right? So as soon as the energy cooled down enough to start forming particles, which is a process we do understand, right? That's explained by Einstein's famous equation, E equals mc squared. Given enough energy, divide that by c squared. If that um, equals the mass of a fundamental particle, then a fundamental particle can be created out of nothing but energy. The only thing you have to respect are the conservation laws, conservation of charge, conservation of energy, and conservation of momentum. So as long as you respect those conservation laws, uh, you can and do see, both in the lab and in the universe, uh, any of these particles being created. Um, so the original creation event of matter would be energy congealing into fundamental particles, right? So way early here, where it says particles form, we're not looking at hydrogen or helium. We're not even looking at protons or neutrons. We're looking at electrons, yes, because they're fundamental particles. Some quarks, yes. Some gluons, yes, and some photons, right? So um, the, cons the bare bone constituents of matter, as we understand it from labs, from experiments we've done in labs, to um, investigate what, you know, the atoms are made out of. Then as time goes on and energy and the temperature cools down, you can get composite forms of matter, right? And so the first one to be formed here would be, you know, quarks hanging out together and making other forms of matter such as our familiar proton, right? And then some of those protons fused together um, and made uh, neutrons and helium nuclei, and that's as far as it could go in the temperature because, remember, it's cooling down this whole time, and then you get to um, hydrogen and helium. So we start off with pure energy. Then that energy congeals into fundamental particles. Then fundamental particles get together and make some composite particles, um, and then at the very end, we have these hydrogen and helium nuclei and a soup of free electrons that then congeals into neutral matter, right? Now, it shouldn't be surprising to you that it worked out that you have an equal number of electrons and protons, right? In order to get empty space here at 400,000 years, you, you had to have roughly an equal amount of um, positive and negative charge. Well, that's a conservation law, right? So if you start off with pure energy, energy has no charge. So the net charge of the universe has to be zero. And the net charge of the universe is zero at every single stage of the game. So we're not actually getting something for nothing. We're taking the zero charge that the universe began with when it was pure energy here in the early stages of the Big Bang, and we still have a zero net charge here at the end. We've just divided into positive and negative. And that's actually where all the matter comes from too, right? All the conservation laws actually add up to be zero, right? So when people say, uh, in the Big Bang theory, how does something come from nothing? You can say, well, I got bad news for you, buddy. Uh, the whole universe adds up to nothing, right? There's an e For every negative charge, there's a positive charge. For every charge that has momentum in the plus x direction, there's momentum in the negative x direction. For everything that's spinning clockwise, there's something spinning clockwise. And um, the, the, the hardest one to understand is the whole idea of matter, and that is explained through E equals mc squared. There's so much negative gravitational potential energy in the universe as a whole because of all the attractive energy that is contained uh, between the masses that are attracting each other, that if you add up all that negative energy, it is, um, by best estimates, about the right uh, amount of negative joules to give you all the mass in the universe, right? So take all the mass in the universe, multiply it by c squared, you get an incredible positive amount of energy that you need to have in the beginning in order to create all that mass. But uh, all that ener positive energy is offset by all the negative energy and gravitational potential energy. And so we have something from nothing is the whole story. As Alan Guth said, the, the father of inflation theory at MIT, he said uh, the universe is a free lunch, it is the ultimate free lunch.
it's really kind of amazing that conservation laws, particle physics, and uh, you know, cosmology have all come together to create this explanation. So we have a pretty uh, detailed understanding here of how we go from nothing to energy to fundamental particles to composite particles to the building block elements of the universe to the modern structure we have. But there are still a few things left for us to explore, right? So here are a few questions people have about this cosmic microwave background. Um, how can the universe, which is already so big at this point, have such a uniform temperature, right? We remember we're only seeing microscopic variations in these blue and red temperatures when we probe the cosmic microwave background. Um, and that is reflected in the fact that the universe overall has a pretty uniform density. Sure, it's clumped together in stars and galaxies, but those are spread around pretty evenly. And so you have a pretty even distribution of mass, which comes from the fact that we have a pretty even cosmic microwave background, which means that things were this part of the universe over here is the same temperature as this part of the universe over here. But they really didn't have time to exchange photons, right, because everything's expanding so quickly. We're intercepting those photons today in the form of cosmic microwave background. So why and how can such distant parts of the universe, even at this earliest stage that we can see, be at the same temperature? And um, that is answered, uh, along with a couple of other um, questions, by this idea of cosmic inflation, right, that Alan Guth came up with in the 1960s, which is an intersection of our understanding of particle physics and general relativity. So you can see in this graphic here from NASA that I'm using that there is this you know, creation event here, and then there's this really steep expansion, and then over here the expansion is less steep, right? And it, it's not necessarily realistic or to scale, but this idea of this dramatic unfolding here, that's the inflationary period, right? Which actually has an, you know, equations behind it and good physics behind it. Like I said, a combination of fundamental particle physics and gravity, and I have a video linked that you guys can look at what Alan Guth does a brief explanation of that. And it is this um, um, many or super fast expansion of the universe that um, all of these points that are not in contact here by the time the cosmic microwave background were actually in contact, were side by side, not that long ago. And so they didn't have time to, after you, to actually drift apart and um, be at various temperatures. Uh, because of this inflationary period, right? So, so this part of the universe was right next to that part of the universe over here. And within the first fraction of a second, the universe expanded many, many more time, expanded much more rapidly than it's expanding today. And, um, and that explains why the uniformity of matter today and the uniformity of the temperature and the cosmic microwave background. Okay, so that's one mystery resolved. Another mystery is why are there tiny fluctuations? And thank goodness there are, right? Because it is these tiny fluctuations in the early universe that gives room for the clumping to start taking place that you need to give birth to the stars, that you need to make the heavier elements, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, the story to get to us, right? And this very tiny inhomogeneity, right? The fact that there are these really um, small variations in temperature from one point uh, to another in the universe. That is also explained. That one was explained by Stephen Hawking in the late 60s, early 70s. And I have a little video linked of Hawking explaining that for you to look at. And uh, basically, he used the laws of quantum mechanics. You know, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle portion of that is that you cannot, it is not knowable with arbitrary precision, uh, precision where a particle is located and its momentum. And so he used that indeterminacy of quantum mechanics and applied it to the conditions of the early universe and showed that there had to be variations, right? That the laws of physics demand it. You cannot have a completely uniform universe that obeys the laws of quantum mechanics. So he actually, you know, like, like Alan Guth used mass, math and the laws of physics to show that an inflationary period was possible. Uh, Hawking used math and quantum mechanics to show that there are early inhomogeneities in the universe. I mean, they would exist before this time period, and they sh are showing up. This is the first evidence we have it, and that's the seeds for where empty space is where, versus where matter is today. Now, there's another mystery uh, which has not been resolved, right? So here's the Nobel Prize lurking in the, in the future for you guys. Um, when we congeal mass from energy, like I was telling you earlier that we can do, um, when we do that in the lab, or we see it happen in uh, particle physics, um, we get 50-50 matter and antimatter that comes out of that. And the antimatter um, 
of course, doesn't hang out for very long because we live in a universe that's filled with matter. So if you have an antimatter, it'll encounter its matter counterpart and they will mutually annihilate. And so that's why we don't really learn about antimatter in like, you know, high school physics classes or whatever. Uh, but it's definitely a, a big part of our understanding of particle physics. So the question is, why wasn't the universe exactly 50-50 matter and antimatter like we see in the labs here? And, we, and, and by symmetry at first, it appears it should be. Um, and thank goodness it wasn't, because once again, if during the period of the cosmic microwave background, if you got 50% hydrogen and 50% anti-hydrogen, then eventually gravitationally they will meet, and actually they're charged oppositely, so they'll meet much quicker than that, and they would annihilate, and the universe would just go back to an all-energy state, right? So um, judging on the evidence of the size and the energy and the distribution of mass in the universe, the observable universe, uh, it's something like, you know, we think there was a minor imbalance in like the fifth decimal place. So there's like 50.00001% uh, matter and 49.999999% antimatter. And so there was a lot of mutual annihilation that happened in, in the early universe. And then by the time things settled out and we got the cosmic microwave background, that slight imbalance left, left us with a universe that had matter and mostly empty space. Um, and so um, this is an active area of uh, understanding that people are trying to um, see some uh, asymmetries in the laws of physics that would explain this. Okay, uh, let's see what I missed here. So let me go. Um, so I did talk about the e equals mc squared, uh, that the matter and antimatter equal amounts should have been created. Um, we talked about the difference between fundamental particles and subatomic particles. Fundamental particles, yeah, interesting thing about fundamental particles is they actually not only are they, do they not have internal constituent pieces, you can't break them up, but because of that, they actually don't have a size or volume associated with them, right? Like if you look up what's the size of a proton, you will find a number, right? If you look up what is the size of an electron, uh, you can get numbers like what's the size of the orbital, the electrons hanging in, or what's the wavelength of it or something, but you won't actually get a size for it. Same thing with quarks. And, and uh, photons and stuff. You can get um, quantum mechanical attributes of them, but you won't actually get a size. It turns out that volume, structure, and size, um, those things come from the relationship between particles. All right, so we talked about how it was plasma, and so the light was kind of trapped, and then it cools down and becomes mostly empty space in the cosmic microwave background, which is now you know, 2.7 degrees Kelvin was about 3,000 degrees Kelvin back then. That's, that's the ionization temperature of um, hydrogen. Um, antimatter, so let me, in case you don't know, antimatter is really not a made-up thing. It's not a science fiction thing. It just means you take the particles that you already know and you reverse everything about them. So, for instance, everything except for mass, that is. So you take a proton, and if your proton is spin up and positively charged, and, and that's what we call matter, then the antimatter version of that would be negatively charged and spin down. Um, so electron uh, is negatively charged, so the anti-electron is positively charged. And they have made, in CERN, they have made anti-hydrogen atoms. Um, what they do is they, they suck all the air out of, a, out of a container, so there's no regular matter in there at all, and then they put it in a strong magnetic field to sort of keep the antimatter circulating, and they inject an antiproton, a negatively charged proton, and then they inject a positively charged electron and then it goes into orbit and it makes an anti-hydrogen atom. I mean, that, that is pretty cool, right? So these things are real, and, uh, you know, we think we do understand them. Uh, but, you know, and here's the last bullet point, why, why in the early universe was there a slight imbalance and there was slightly more matter? One part in a billion, that's the number. Um, so that's an unresolved symmetry problem in physics that people are working on today. Cosmic microwave background, we talked about how the universe has cooled down and that light is got the cosmological shift, so it's down to 2.7. In a real way, you can think about the universe. It used to be have an average temperature of 3,000 degrees Kelvin uh, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, and now has an average temperature of 2.7 degrees Kelvin, and that's, of course, heading towards zero as time goes on. Uh, the minor variations, we talked about Hawking. Oh, is this late? I got the year wrong. No, this is 1982, so much more recently than I thought. Um, and this idea about cosmic inflation. Okay, so I've got a couple videos for you guys to watch about inflation and um, the Hawking uh, inhomogeneity. 
Um, but that's uh, it for this talk. Thanks for listening. <laughs>